Hey, welcome to Honest to a Malt, episode 11. We made it past the 10. Yeah, we did. We're in that magical club now of 720,000. Thanks to everyone that's listening. Um, it's uh, still myself, Duncan, and uh, two puds, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we got away with that for a couple of episodes. <laughs> mm, we did, but, you know, it's just, it's all anyone writes in about, you know. just <laughs> <laughs> Can I meet him? Yeah. And share a dessert. Is it really true that he does two two tastings at the same time all the time? Yeah, it pretty is, yeah. much. Yes. <laughs> That's what he does, <laughs> and and then tells everyone they're special. No, you are special. You're special in many ways. Yeah. Anyway, episode eleven. Episode eleven, Mike. What's the name of the episode today? Blinded by the brand. Oh, so what's it going to be about then? Uh, not being blinded by branding, essentially. I'm so, blind tasting. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to dig in a little bit to where kind of blind tasting uh, took off um, in wine and then, you know, some of the famous things. And then we're involved in blind drams um, and um, we'll recount the last one of those. Uh, but a, before we get which to Which was that, a bit of a car crash. Let's just put that out there first. <laughs> it was. Whoever <laughs> whoever hosted that one and chose to oh. it's really easy to take a look at themselves. <laughs> Oh, I did. I know you try to educate people and uh, all you get is a hard time for it. <laughs> people just want winners. Um, Mike, um, it's that time of the pod. What's been in your glass? Tell us, Mike, what's been in your glass? Tell us, my friend, what have you been drinking? The drams of fire. The drams of fire. Well, it was a sample given to me, I want to say, by Glen Scotia. They were happily assisting me on my non-whiskey buy-in embargo journey, right. which has now failed <laughs> quite impressively. <laughs> I am well and truly back on the buy-in wagon. But, um, yeah, so they sent some samples out, and, uh, yeah. yeah, we had a little taste of that one. And, yeah, to be, I loved it, to be fair. I didn't really drink much of the last festival release, okay. um, so this one was sort of like quite new i haven't had it for a while the festival releases and yeah this one was finished in a white port and it was just stunning to me it was literally the the cheap frozen black currant cheesecakes you used to get but smoked yeah. with lemon juice all over it. it smelled like that it tasted like that obviously then with loads of like the industrial smoke rather than peat but yeah damn good stuff your notes were quite different to my notes um i, I said it was sort of sweet and salty with a a little savoury to give some balance. Mm. Oily on I, the palate, drying to the finish. Coastal notes are there. Bags of peach and freshly cut grass on the nose. Into the palate, caramel, a little wooden spice, some brown sugar. I felt like I got like apricots, more peach, ripe figs. And then sort of the wood spice and salinity kind of dominated the finish. Uh, it is very good. It's very tasty. I still can't decide which of my favourites out of the, the camp, you know, those releases. But yeah. our notes were quite different, weren't they? Which I thought was... Yeah, and I think looking at the posts people put online, again, they, some of the, some people were all about the lemon. Um, other right. people were saying about those sort of like uh, bitter sort of fruit things. So I sort of, I think I hit middle ground, to be fair. There was um, definitely lemon in it. Um, yeah. I, I hadn't put, written it down. But I just got but... so much black currant on it. Now, again, that could just be something I was tasting at the time. But yeah, I tried it over a couple of different days. And all Still I get black even when I smelt it, it was just smoked cheap black current frozen but it's really cheap <laughs> yeah no it's the ones i used to have it really well. cheap 65 every, quid a bottle every super sunday, cheap black no, the, the cheesecake every oh, sunday right. for dessert sarah lee rubbish, sarah lee sarah lee iceland jobby frozen yeah. thing thanks mum um yeah we were having instead of that um uh what's the is it vietnamese what's the vietnamese world or something or Vien, viennese what was it called viennese, viennese world. worlds yeah that's what we were having viennese worlds or proper like bread and butter pudding yeah yeah well, we, we both we both tried it, and I think we'll post our thoughts on um, on our blog. Yeah, but it's definitely a whiskey that's still available. That's that's worth getting, and they all are. All of those festival releases. The are. price I looked yesterday, they're still it's still available in loads of places, and it's ranging from about sixty one to sixty five quid. Obviously, check your postage costs and stuff. But yeah, when you compare it to some of the other releases that are out there from other companies. Yeah, yeah. It'll be around for a little while because I think there's, yeah. there's there's more than twenty thousand bottles. I picked up one for ten percent off in a sale, 
Um, and I picked up another one at RRP uh, off the website with the, with the Glen Cairn included. You know, I love yeah. a bargain. So you do. Good value, and it's definitely worth having two bottles of that in the cupboard. So if you if you haven't got one yet, and you're thinking about what to get next, and you like um, Glen Scotia and that slightly funky, smoky, you like a bit of peat mm. and fruity whiskies, it's a good summer whiskey for sure. If it's still in stock in like a month's time, I'll be picking up a bottle. Definitely, I've bought. Yeah, I, I've well and truly fallen off my embargo, so I'm putting myself back on a temporary embargo. <laughs> now I've won. <laughs> I've gone. I went all out. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, yeah. I mean, I should say as well, um, getting a sample itself, a uh, scent was kind, but I'd already she already bought a bottle because I just couldn't wait. <laughs> so, yeah. I knew as soon as you fell off your embargo, you were yeah. buying that straight away. 100%. Like, yeah. You instantly went and grabbed one of those. Yeah, that's that bottle that I took to that barbecue the other week and people loved yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they were really enjoying it. So, what else has been in your glass then so, in the last week? Yeah, basically that. I've been trying to sort of take it easy somewhat. I went back to Wales quickly, but. In right. my fallen off embargo, I bought the new Glen Goyne teapot dram. Nice. Which I have literally just cracked now. So Bargain 140 quid there. Yeah. Don't tell <laughs> her. Don't say the price. Lara, you might listen oh, sorry. To this. Been, just edit that out. Deep just deep. Uh, um, edit that out. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I've literally just opened that and done a neck pour on that. So as we're sipping away, and I've got to be honest, straight away, it seems a bit flat. But right. um, it is quite a hefty little dram. It's quite, How quite flat? Hefty. Like like flat Coke? Or is it just over-sherried? It just feels a bit like there's not a lot going on at the moment. But we'll I know it. it's... I imagine it's quite young. 58.9%. Um, so, yeah, I think a bit of air usually will bring out the sort of... A, it's an Oloroso cask finish as yeah. well. So will help that massively. So, um, yeah, so that's what's in my glass at the moment. Um, nice. What have you been drinking? Um, well, I went away um, and, you know, um, I did blind drams from uh, Serbia. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I had those with me. So, I, you know, uh, tasting that, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and I picked up at the airport two bottles of uh, Glen Murray, um, the 18 is on some sort of offer. So I think it's about 90 pounds for two bottles of 18 year old bourbon cask. And it's mostly kind of, I think it's 47.2%. And it's good mostly enough. kind of, yeah, it's, it's really good. It's lots of vanilla, apples, pears, a little bit of spice, really easy drinkable. So we had that the day after a wedding there. And then another bottle with a bunch of friends um, playing like, um, you know, sitting, hanging out, playing like, Daft games like Truth or Dare or or whatever mm. else or you know if there's eight people playing that game of eight, that was it was fun. They, they, they you know they really enjoyed it. They really liked that whiskey. Um, it's a good whiskey to pick up at the airport for sure. So I think if you're traveling for an airport and you want to get a couple of bottles, that's great value. That's what I'd say. Also, again, very summary. I was buying yeah. a whiskey for warm weather. You know, was, I didn't want something really sherried. I, yeah, I, I didn't yeah. really want anything. I couldn't get anything peated because I don't know if they would like that or not. Um, felt like a bit of a risk. Um. Yeah, so that's so was... up to all these like, new people at the wedding. Hello, and they're like, "What the hell is this guy bought?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also didn't want to get anything with too high ABV, but um, I also took over a sample of. I wanted to take something really wacky for them to try, mm. so I took over. I don't know, a hundred mils or you know, seventy-five mils or whatever of um that Kilkerran eight car strength sherry, the one that's really like dark chocolate and cream yeah. and tobacco. I wanted them to just try something bonkers, and so many people tried it. They're all having just tiny sips of it, and they were like, "Oh gosh, it's crazy!" Was it like? Yeah, they loved thing? it. They loved it. They thought it was incredible. It's so rich and decadent, isn't it? Mm. So it was nice for them to try something. Um, because obviously I was trying a lot of rakia, like fruit brandy. Um, <sighs> lots of you know, they're all it'll be peach or it'd be apricot or it could be um quince. There's all different types over there, but it's they're all they're into their kind of fruits fruit based spirits like done properly or does it all taste the same without being too offensive no no it, 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 you'll taste the fruit in it but you that's really kind of all you'll get you won't get much else you'll get yeah. maybe they, i did try some cask age ones but they were like home cask age stuff okay so they're like sort of diying it so nice. for example one of them was overly bitter and they'd stored it in it transpired joke. <laughs> yeah they'd stored it i don't know what what the wood was but they'd stored it in something for six months and it was very small what they stored it in so it was over wooded. Oh, yeah. But, and I said to him, it should have probably just been six weeks or something. Anyway, that's, you know, 
science stay away from science <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i tried a bunch of rackers they tried some whiskey everyone had a good time Quality. you know yeah you know, uh good times were had um and now i'm also trying a glengoin um i got delivery of that um 15 year old single cask um it is celebrating the coronation 2023 so like a like the non-flipper that i am it is open <laughs> who's the which uh bottler was it um douglas lang nice uh cask reference dl 13640 um you can send me the speeding ticket to that registration and uh it's really it's amazing it's very zingy oily um it's got lots of orange in it caramel it's nutty i still kind of get that kind of milky tea vibe that i get off sort of refill glencoin casks it's absolutely gorgeous i think it cost about 80 quid in the end and i love it i it's juicy juicy it is juicy it says juicy on the bottle but they're right it's really juicy i've probably tried some other stuff in the week but they're the main things that sort of stood out for me um really so it's been um it's been well week and a half now isn't it almost yeah oh yeah because we did two pods back to back last did, time we so. did back to back didn't we yeah a little yeah. reminiscing yeah so um i think um getting into the main subject for the for the for the day we thought we, we should probably be a bit more professional than we are usually <laughs> <laughs> oh this is a stretch so we wanted yeah. to learn a bit more about the world of blind tasting and hmm. uh, you know what when did people start getting into this it's something that we do in whiskey and um you know wine is really the other thing which has the sort of depth of flavor and so we had a search to see when you know what happened in the world of wine around blind tasting and it turned out there was something called the judgment of paris wine tasting uh which changed the course of history for like infamous anything. infamous yeah it was a blind tasting competition held in 1976 um which caused shock waves tremors around the wine world um and uh it was something which was only reported by one journalist because no other journalist wanted to go because they thought it would just be a run-of-the-mill thing mm. and so it turned out it was supposed to be some sort of pr stunt from a guy called stephen spurrier an english wine merchant um and he wanted to pit basically californian wines versus french wines yeah um he was trying to kind of you know expand i guess what he was um selling at his uh his shop and so we got a whole bunch of like really top panel wine critics, you know, the finest wine critics that you could get to come and judge it. Um, It'd be like inviting like... you and me to a whiskey taste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our equivalent in 1976. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a panel of Mike and Duncan's. Yeah. <laughs> so some, yeah, some actually qualified people, not just, um, not just uh, mouthy punters like us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, basically like, I don't know who they were. It says so in this article. We'll link to it. To keep things consistent, all the reds were Californian um, Cabernets and, uh, and French Bordeaux, and all the white wines were Californian Chardonnays and white Burgundies. Um, hmm. Obviously, in France, you know, they name uh, wines for the grapes um, based on their region. Um, so, you know, um, if you know anything about wine or not. But the panel had a challenge which was to taste the wines blind so they and this is really important they hadn't done this before in the world yeah. of wine so this is 1976 this is the first time it kind of sort of happened and um they had to sort of uh you know try to name and identify the information they couldn't see any information and they were supposed to just judge the wine solely on that so completely blind basically no name no region just wine in an unmarked glass like you do whiskey in an unmarked yeah, glass because at the time only french wine was seen as any good on a world yeah, 100%. stage 100 there was yeah, nothing else like not like it. today yeah and and so yeah none of these you didn't have like australian wine or chilean wine or new zealand wine or South african wine so, how mad is that like not even italian crazy, isn't it? sort of, yeah so this actually paved the way to give confidence and hope to those other regions to start producing wine funnily enough it's, it's one of the sort of starting points of that so because everyone thought it was such a foregone conclusion that the french wine was going to win only one journalist turned up which is this guy called george Tabor. Um, who went as a favor to the to the person who was hosting it um i guess if otherwise maybe this wouldn't have been reported um and they had to give the wine a score out of 20 and um to everyone's you know surprise uh the winning wines were from napa valley um which was um you know one of the cabernets um in this case it was called stag's leap wine cellars 
and a Chardonnay. Um, Chateau Montalena, which I have tried getting hold of since. Uh, have you? I, yeah, so there was a film on this topic called Bottle Shock. Oh, uh, have you seen I a think, film about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why when you sort of uh, sort of murmured about it, I went, oh, yeah, yeah, big time. Because I think Alan Rickman plays um, Stephen Spurrier, who's like the oh, right. And yeah, so um, really good film, actually. It's quite a, an easy watch, very sort of nice, chilled out movie. What's that film called again? Uh, Bottle, Bottle Shock. Shock. Yeah. I'll have to look that up. Have a look. Because uh, then, yeah, because obviously Chateau Montalena is the sort of... Um, vineyard that they focus on in the film really yeah and uh yeah you you can't get that for any reasonable cash these days now because since then it's obviously gone through the roof all oh, right okay being a yeah. victim of its own success again which is a, a common theme seemingly in various things so yeah man well that's that so that was basically one of the first examples of um you know blind tasting sort of being written about and causing a sort of shake up and then uh, I was quite interested in that. I didn't realise you'd seen the film. And then mm. you were very interested in talking about the the sort of branding side of it, so like the Pepsi side of things. Yeah, so the other sort of major um, challenge of the sort of, I think it was late 70s, was Coke versus Pepsi. So obviously Coke had massive market dominance and Pepsi came in and uh, were like the new kid the challenger. And they came up with that brilliant sort of um, advertising line of blind tasting, essentially, in, in car parks, outside supermarkets and things. Malls and things like that. Yeah. So which do you prefer? Uh, blindfold on. And it was, yeah, try the Coca-Cola, try the Pepsi. And the Pepsi absolutely smashed them on the taste tests. And I think Coke's immediate response was to change their recipe in absolute right. panic to try and mirror Pepsi. And that's how that's how so I was I was reading about it, and that's how classic Coke Coke came out, and ended up with sort of the the new Coke, which is the sort of Coke you get today, and the classic one, which was in the gold, I think. Yeah. Or something well, basically, like that. So it was like where they changed the recipe and then went back to uh, they didn't announce they were changing the recipe, so suddenly right. everyone hated the Coke, and then they went new Coke, and it was just the old recipe, but right. people were then so okay. focused on old peps, uh, old Coke, new Coke. That they completely forgot about Pepsi. <laughs> Pepsi just dropped off entirely because the challenge became all about old Coke and new Coke. But it's, it, it, I think it's the perfect example, really, of communicating kind of the importance of brand and, and taste. So Pepsi did the challenge. They said they called Coke was M. No, Pepsi was M and Coca Cola was Q. Mm. And they won resoundingly uh, across the board. And then Coke pushed back and they themselves coke versus coke yeah <laughs> and then called it like m and q and m1 um, marginally it, though marginally. it was a good response from coke to be fair they sort of saved themselves on that little front, bit but, but this is this is what's important like pepsi actually the data shows that pepsi won overall but they didn't capitalize on it because they they didn't get enough people to to switch they weren't yeah they they weren't getting pepsi uh, like um, enough cans of Pepsi into people's houses that they were just drinking Pepsi, that they would just become a habit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about habitual drinking, isn't it? You know, we, this is the time when people are drinking, like, like, like people are smoking cigarettes all the time. You know, they're drinking sugar drinks all the time. Um, I've been watching Mad Men. And you're saying this is sort of 70s time. Right? Mad mm. Men is like the advertising company. They drink all the time in Mad Men. They just drink whiskey, all times of the day. I can't imagine what it would, if that's in any way accurate, I cannot possibly fathom what it would be like to drink that much alcohol all the way during <laughs> a working day. Like working just smoking, in a distillery. <laughs> they're just smoking all of the time. Like they just smoke everywhere, all throughout the office, all day long, uh, just smoking and drinking. So I don't know how much it's overblown. I'd love to know if that's really towards the truth or not. Um, but I, I can't imagine how the sort of tat <laughs> the tatters your body <laughs> would be in. Just smoking and drinking all day long. <laughs> I bet they loved going to work, though. <laughs> Once they were over the hangover, anyway. Probably, but it was their job in Mad Men to convince people to buy stuff that they, you know, didn't, you know, necessarily yeah. need. Right? That's what they are. They're an advertising agency. It's like the heydays of, uh, of of advertising. And Pepsi came up with this genius idea to use the blind thing as like an advertising thing and to get. Um, notoriety through which they achieved yeah. but they didn't manage didn't follow up with the strategy 
but it still shows the importance of blind tasting, which is Mate, that if you told people it was Coca-Cola exactly. versus Pepsi, who knows what kind of landslide it would have been for Coca-Cola. And it's funny because there was another one um, within the sort of stuff that we'd spoken about in the week. And there's, uh, I don't know if you came across it, the Schlitz versus Budweiser. Did you see that one? I had a bit of a skim. What happened with that one? So essentially, same kind of thing as Pepsi and Coke. Uh, Schlitz um, did all this research and came out hands down on top. Is Schlitz that, is Schlitz that beer from Devon? Uh, no, no, Schlitz is an American beer. <laughs> <laughs> what? It just it sounds like it should be German, doesn't it? But it's obviously not. <laughs> is no, it a German-owned American beer? It's probably the same as Budweiser, is Bud Var and stuff back in the day. Right. But it's the yeah, stolen it's like, every, like yeah. everything else in America. God damn! Woo! God damn! Stolen. No offense God to damn, our stole American it. listeners and happy uh, Memorial Day weekend. Six percent. Um, we can six yeah. percent. Uh, thank you for listening, but you know, don't be too <laughs> don't be too touchy. Eighty four percent. You know, they uh, they're UK, the majority. Ninety four percent. Ninety four percent. Not because it's six. It? Yeah, yeah, I think it's like six percent from America. I think then there's a few dotted about everywhere. But yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. Schlitz basically backed themselves in this thing and were just like got way too cocky. So. Um, in 1981 is when they did all these blind tastings. They uh, essentially agreed to get the halftime show at the AFC American football playoff game. Right. And they did a live blind tasting with a hundred diehard Bud fans <laughs> and uh, 54% chose Bud. <laughs> oh, that's brutal. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh. and they claim that as a victory. No, that was like complete failure. So the, right. in the, in the pre everything said they were going to win. This is easy, but in in the cold light of day, right. when you were put under the lights live in front of everyone, massive stinker. So, and I think that in in that is the essence of blind of blind tasting. It, mm. it can literally be um, a, quite brutal. <laughs> oh, as you know, <laughs> yeah, it can be really brutal. So, um. Is there, is there any other examples that you want to go through before we get into talking about blind drams and back onto a whiskey? No, I think I think that sets it up quite nicely. Sort of beautiful. Going beautiful. Into, to our blind drams, as it were. Yeah, well, go easy on me on this one, Mike. No, to be fair, I, I, I take the mic, but you have had like I think the the third or fourth most successful blind drams in history before yeah. this. So. In in history, I love it. You make it sound like it's been going on for like thirty in years. History. Yeah, since the dawn of time. 450 million years ago, dinosaurs walked the earth and Duncan was choosing drams. Well, not just me, <laughs> lots of people. And, and in that 450 million year period, you know, yeah, yeah one of the top three. Yeah. But anyway, so, this one got panned. So I went all out and um, we should explain what blind drams is. I was going to say, do you want me to, so blind yeah, drams. Do an, do an explainer for people. So blind drams as we take part now is, it's under the guise of the blind drams consortium. Mm. Uh, it's 28 people that essentially chip in 35 quid each and one person selects uh, five different whiskies and they buy 10 bottles of that and then get split, re-bottled uh, re and sent out blind. You've just got basically mm. a number on there, one to five. That's right. We all do one big Twitter tasting where we all go through at the same time. We run a little Zoom call where it's slightly more social, should we say, and that goes on into the wee early hours till mm. someone... Nowhere to hide on the Zoom call. No. Nowhere to hide. No. The Zoom call Except if you turn your camera off, maybe, yeah. but, you know. Well, I think this one was, yeah, this was good. It's like Duncan basically pretended that he was in Serbia so he could get out of it. He could I was in Serbia. Was okay, I was yeah, in yeah. Serbia. Yeah. Decent. I was in a room, Mike. I was in a room <laughs> in a kitchen and I'm sitting there talking to you guys and next to me I've got Nicola, um, like an extended family member, and he's also trying whiskies at the same time and asking me questions about them. And I'm trying to keep him, you know, also in, entertained and engaged, talking to you guys. And then simultaneously, in an, in another room just off, um, uh, we were trying to get toddler, <laughs> toddlers to... <laughs> because to get toddlers to try whiskey. Yeah, people were people were panning me and I wasn't able to respond. I was just sitting there taking it. <laughs> like, like, so, um, so, so Blind Jones Consortium, that's what I heard you say, 28 yeah. people. Um, and, you know, um, one lucky person, the host, gets to choose the whiskey. A great excuse to smuggle whiskey into the house. Yep. Because uh, obviously loads of whiskey's turning up. So, 
you know, you can just and it say, checks oh, it's that, for... that checks that FOMO need. Do you know what I mean? It's for like... blind drams. Like a lot of bowls have turned up this week. Yeah. It's for blind drams. Don't worry about it. It's all for other people. You're just you can buy whatever you whatever want. you want. It's like a pass to get whatever you want. Yeah. So that is a lot of fun, and that can take as as little or as long time as you want. Now I've done two of these now, and you've done some as well. Yeah. The first one, I went all out on choosing the best whiskey I could. I just picked, and I went with a really loose theme, like the soul of wood. Mm. You know, that could be anything. I just picked anything that would allow me to choose whatever whiskey I wanted to choose. And um, I scored really well. This time, I went in the spirit <laughs> of it, and I, uh, I really wanted to pick something that hasn't been done. And there's been quite a lot of blind drums so far. We're on to 33, I think. I think next the next is, one is 33, so yeah. 33, which is Whiskey with Molly, Ben. Yep. He's doing that one. So um, I, so 32, this was the 32nd one. And I wanted to pick something that ha people haven't done. And looking back through them, I realized no one has done beer finished whiskeys. You know, whiskeys that have been done in, finished in beer. And I thought, wow, you know, everyone loves beer. Most people do. <laughs> everyone loves whiskey. This has got to be a winner. I've tried some. I usually quite like them. I thought, yeah. So I, I went with that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and how did that go? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was all right. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I'm riffing you, but it was it was a mixed bag um, across the board. Well, I think, but but you know, it's I, I didn't. It's the theme, so you know, I don't really mind what the scores were. Mm. What mattered was was it interesting, and there was really good engagement, and people were guessing all kinds of wacky stuff. There was, uh, we, I was, we were encouraging people to guess the theme as they were trying the whiskies. Like, yeah, this is it. So you, you like when you're taking part and you don't have to do this, obviously, because you get some people that are quite new to it and you basically try and narrow down a region. If you can have a guess at distillery, even better. Um, and age. Then, yeah, age. You don't have ABP. to do that. You just do tasting notes. You can yeah. just do tasting notes and say if you that, like it or not. Yeah, is it oily? Stuff, is it dry? Yeah. Is it salty? Is it sweet? You don't have to do them all stuff, but some of us like to hang our hat and have a guess. And look silly, like, you know, we're, we're the schlitz of the whiskey world. <laughs> like the schlitz of the whiskey yeah. world. We look yeah. silly a lot of the time. But yeah, so, I was so chuffed because I at least got one of the distilleries correct on um, from you. What were people guessing? Some people were saying, I'm trying to remember, someone was saying um, they thought they were all blends. Yeah. You had Somebody some... else guessed um the i they, will sell my house if this isn't if this is scotch da, 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 all that oh yeah kind of there's thing. world whiskey oh. yeah oh i loved it loved it four of <laughs> four of the five were scotch they were yeah. all single malts this is um, grain whiskey it's not a, yeah people were saying malts. it's grain people going no, i think it's grain oh it was yeah. mad people it was all over the shop with the guesses which was great um so it was, it was lovely that people were engaging which I mean, just shows the effect that finishing has because for some really experienced tasters to be yeah. completely bamboozled is good. way off the mark. Yeah. yeah, way off the mark. And and it's it's also very humbling, isn't it? Trying stuff blind. But mm. look, what it came down to in the end was um, there was a range of whiskies. So the first one was Fetican, eight year old, and that was um, f a mixture of beer casks all thrown back in together, and that had lots of tropical notes, and that did okay. People kind of like that. I can't remember the score, yeah. but it was a good start, apparently. And the second one was... The SNWS IPA finish, which yeah, I ben gave Riek. you a five out of five, which I don't like to do. And somebody you. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, that really hurt me having to give you a five out of five. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a heartwarming moment. It was, yeah. a lot of, it was gentle, gentle tears all around the room. At that point. But somebody Candles else got... being lit and held up in the air. Phone lights on. <laughs> phones on. Yeah, yeah lights Cold off. play on. playing. Yeah. yeah. Um, someone else scored it a zero, though, didn't they? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, like... we should say what the should say what the scoring is. Basically, it's zero to five. Yeah. And also, we haven't mentioned him yet. This is all organised by Brian Malt Musings. Yeah. Um, he's the person that puts in all the admin to to get um uh, to get it organised every time and get people signed up. And he's the uh, founder of it. Um, and uh, he runs. We will link to his website. And we've also we haven't said like. You've done loads of these, Mike, right? You've been in it since the start or something. So Blind Drams came from five of us randomly liking a post on something and said, oh, we should send some whiskeys out to people. And basically five people replied. We went, okay, should we send whiskeys to each other? 
Yeah. And that is how it started. There were literally five of us. And we did quite a I can't remember how many did we did loads. Um, and then it sort of got to the point where one of the guys dropped off and we went, you know what, we can expand this and sort of push the price of a bit. Cause it, there was no, it was completely whatever you wanted. Like I was, if I'd had a good month in work or whatever at the time, I'd go out and drop 250 quid on a bottle or something. Right. And the other one share it like hundred. Yeah. Like completely. Yeah. So um, it was, it was just arbitrary before, but now yeah. it's like organized as fixed budgets. Yeah. And um, I think the budget is about 80 pounds ish a bottle or something like that. Yeah. Approximately overall. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, you should check out, um, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to see like the wacky results of different whiskies, a lot of whiskies have been done in this blind drams over time. You, you can see it on, we'll link to it, but Brian's, um, malt musings. Whiskey Brian blog website. Is the king of whiskey spreadsheets, possibly the king <laughs> of spreadsheets. I don't want yeah, to he loves a sexy spreadsheet. Yeah, definitely the king of whiskey spreadsheets. There is, yeah. I challenge yeah. anyone to compete with his whiskey spreadsheet abilities and like catalog. <laughs> This 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 dram too had a range of zero to five. I can't even remember what the mean or the average was, but the point is, is that someone hated it so much that they would say they don't want to drink it. Tip it you seat. loved it so much, you yep. would absolutely not just buy a bottle. You, I would... would suck the toes of a brand ambassador to get yeah. another sample of it. Is, the, <laughs> is what the five equates to. There's a lot of. Um, there's a there's a lot of reluctance to score whiskeys five because that leads to people posting gifs about toe sucking, <laughs> yeah. Which uh, on the whole isn't that wholesome. No. Uh, so if you get a score of a four, that's excellent. A score of three is very good. A score of two is really still okay. A score of one is pretty bad, and a score of zero is quite a kick in the nuts, really. <laughs> <laughs> quite a kick in the nuts. <laughs> yeah. Just a just a swift kick. Um, so Dram Two did well. Yeah, and that was uh, IPA, right? Which is your Dram, Ben Ben Reich. The Ben um, Reich, yeah, ten year yeah. old from SMWS. And actually SMWS are really helpful. I called up Greville Street and um I asked them if they have any beer finished whiskies and they're like, um, there's nothing online, but we'll see if we dig around and they dug around and they found two bottles of that. So that was uh that was cool. Uh Dram three was uh Glasgow, Glasgow. Distillery. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Have you got the details on it? Was it uh that was a golden ale finish from That's a PX right. cask? Yeah, yeah. So it was a weird one. Golden Ale had been poured into a PX cask, so strange one. So they aged that, the beer, then yeah. bottled the beer, then aged the whiskey. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I, well, I think that they, the whiskey had been aged for a bit in like ex bourbon, but then they'd filled it into or bourbon. Um, bourbon. <laughs> Get oh, the Jesus. biscuits, however. <laughs> hey, biscuit, biscuit time. time. <laughs> I need to get this right before that important day in America and the bourbon episode that's coming up soon. Is that, I think that is like two weeks time. I've got to sort myself <laughs> out. I have to go. I need to get myself into like a, like a psychiatrist or something or a speech therapist or something. I'm afraid you're stuck with it now. It's like me. I have lost. Uh, Glenn Murray is gone. Glenn Murray is the now go-to pronunciation, yeah. unfortunately. Um, it's painful. Though, getting it wrong, getting yeah. it wrong time and time again, isn't it? So yeah. what was, so the, no one, People weren't overly impressed with the golden ale um, no, no. finish from that PX. I, to be fair, I didn't mind it. I, I think I scored you uh, two for the Fetican, five for the uh, SMWS, right? A four for the Glasgow, and then a four for your next one, which what, was bit, from Bimba. London Town. But it was the Bimba Stout finish. I quite yeah. like. See, I quite liked all of them. I really what? liked the Bimba, and the Bimba was kind of like more floral. Yeah. And I thought that's a strange one because, and I heard Dean shout out to Dean from Murray McDavid say this recently. He says it is uncommon, great word, mm. for whiskies to have a floral note. And, you know, other than Bowmore, mm. he's kind of right, isn't he? So this one has a floral element to it. And so I thought that was kind of cool. But people were just like, nope, don't like it. <laughs> don't I like really it. liked it. That was I a said, stout finish, wasn't it? Stout. I think my tweet said, I Imperial will bet stout. my house. That this is Bimba. And yes, I was you did. So happy. You nailed it. Had yeah. you tried that one before? No. No. Nope. So that was the only one of the five that I had actually tried. No, I tried two of them, but one was at a festival, so that doesn't count because I was probably um you know, yeah, let's just say um <laughs> loose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was relaxed at the time. <laughs> and the other one was a whiskey tasting at Bimba Distillery, and I tried it as part of a flight. And and again, I'd I'd had a few, probably three or four, four whiskeys before I got to that one. And I didn't like it in the first taste too much, but then I really tried it again and sat down with it because mm. that was one of the ones that um, 
you know the guy's name. The guy who swears a lot, who's really funny. Darius? No, it's like the owner or something, isn't it? Darius is the, the master, like distiller, the owner. And then No, it's not Darius. It's, um, it's the uh, Luca, maybe maybe it's Luca. Lucas, Luca. Lucas, Lucas or Luca. I think I it's think. Lucas. Sorry. Anyway, Sorry. <laughs> I went so like side story, I went to Bimba to do one of their tastings, which are great. You know, they go round, they show you distillery, I'm like a member, so you get one or two a year. And uh took my wife's dad with me. And um the guy was super funny and he just uh, kept um, dropping F-bombs like every like five words. <laughs> and my, my father-in-law was really anti-swearing. And I was just like, he and he was having a great time. And I was just like, I, I was like, can I relax? Because yeah. I feel like at any point he's going to say to me, there's a lot of swearing, Duncan. <laughs> I, was going, I, was, I was like, going, oh, I was like gripping my chair going, just, just relax. It seems like he's okay with it. The guy's just going, F this and F that and F this. And I was going, this is very funny, but am I going to get this in the year when I leave? Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, honest to a malt. So <laughs> great tasting, and I had the imperial stout bottle as part of that, and I really enjoyed it. Um, in fact, I liked all of them. I was a favourite yeah. one from Tennessee. Anyway, point is, I tried it. Couldn't really properly remember it. I thought it was all right. Hmm. People didn't like it. <laughs> the people people weren't fans overall. No. It's about five years old, I think. It was also the club third edition, I think. But we liked it. I liked it. You liked it. Um, yeah. yeah. And then your last one was a um, Murray McDavid Imperial Stout finish. Yeah, which is bonkers. Yeah. And 13, 13 year old Ardmore. <laughs> <laughs> I. Yeah. People, what were people saying? People were still calling, people were still saying blend or grain at that point, weren't they? Their the guesses were <laughs> so seen, all over the place. I've never seen anything like, like it. The guesses were absolutely absurd. I can imagine it like harping back to the the wine tasting where when it's revealed, one of the French judges, a female, dived over the desk to try and get her scoring back so she would never be tarnished with choosing the oh, American yeah. wine. <laughs> yeah. It's similar. People were so like confused. I couldn't, I couldn't, I felt like that. That Murray McDavid Ardmore, which was a stout cask finish. I think it was like a two, 18 month, two year-ish finish. It was, it was quite mm. a length of finish. And the notes that were written on that were nothing like really what I got. Are they, are they, you know, we're kind of saying earthy and slight bits of smoke. And I, I just got it as like, I just got it as like layers of like syrupy chocolate. And um, yeah. it's just like, it was like kind of rich and thick and syrupy. And that, that's kind of coffee notes. Uh, that's kind of the main things I, I was getting. I, I'd have to go back and check my notes. But I, it was one of those ones that I couldn't decide if I really loved or really didn't love. Yeah. It was a bit like, and it was just an, from another blind tasting that we did together. Was it the Fasamuch or Fasamac or something? It was another Bemriac. It was like 20, 21 years old mm. from Chilton Whiskey. And it was one that on the nose smelt of like Stilton and, and like cheese rind or car bear or something like that. Some kind of like really like pongy cheese. Some form had, of bear. It had a lot of berry cheese going on in it. Mm. And I couldn't decide. It was a bit like, you know, if you sniff your own socks, you're like, oh, do I like that? I don't I like that. I'm not sure. Maybe I like it. Maybe I don't. Right? <laughs> you know, you wrote bodily odor. You're like, oh, I quite like that. Maybe I don't like it. I'm not sure. No, it's a bit like that. No. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So uh -huh. it's one of those ones that I, I just, well, my senses were a bit overwhelmed and I feel like that's what the Ardmore was like. It was a bit sort of overwhelming. But you know, um, that that brings up a good point because it, when you are doing these blinds, the sort of drawback is, it's like a one, one you've got one chance, one opportunity. It's like m, &M. Are you going to take it? You're going to let it go. But you could have had some food earlier in the day that completely knocks off you're tasting for that evening. There's something that might not react well with what's in that whiskey. Whereas on another day, you could love it. Same as like, I've had a, a King Prawn Linguini tonight and I'm not sure that's quite mixing well with the, uh, the Glen Goyne. But I do wonder about that when people are doing blind drams, like what have they eaten during the day? Yeah. Have they just, have they just, have they just been smashing, have they been listening to Andrew Tate and smashing raw onions? <laughs> And like they've, had two, they've had two raw onions about four o'clock and five espressos. Yeah. And then, you know, f four hours later, they're going to get on. I actually often, on blind drams, I will often pour a small amount of each whiskey, mm. about 
five o'clock, so three hours before kickoff or six yeah. o'clock on a Saturday. I'll make sure I finish everything else. Uh, uh, this will be way after lunch, clear yeah. palette, you know, uh, peace and quiet, notepad, and I'll just sit and do my no my nosing thoughts, my palette thoughts, and my finished thoughts on my Todd. Sometimes with my missus, uh, Maria. Um, shout out to Maria. Um, and um, and then that way I'm not getting involved in groupthink. I mean, yeah. I am in because I'll taste them again. I'll only have a tiny bit, like 10 mils. And then I'll have like another 10 mils later or 15 yeah. mils later. But I much prefer that because it really is fully blind. Whereas when we actually do blind drams live, some people say they haven't got time to read stuff. But if you're yeah. posting and engaging with people on Twitter, you are seeing things. You know, someone said biscuits. Someone said biscuits. And then you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, now I get biscuits. Whereas when you've just done it on your own, you know exactly what you got. And you also know how you really feel about that whiskey. Mm. You're not being persuaded by what people are posting. Yeah. So I like to do both. I like to do it on my own ahead on the day. Yeah. And then again with people and I get a second, second bite of the cherry, don't I? Yeah. I, I just yeah. do half the sample um, while I'm doing it. And then uh, at the end of it, start blending stuff and going a bit weird. On the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just pouring into Make a, a giant of it. You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So what, what was what was the comeuppance then out of um, that blind drams with the we did learn something. We did, so we learned something. We like learned one. We learned people people don't, can't don't call. bother doing beer finishes. Beer. Well, no. I, I think we learned. <laughs> I think it's a very small sample set, but I think what we yeah. generally learn is that people seem to like the IPA finish. Yeah, weirdly, and they liked mixed beer cask finishes quite a bit. But the group as a whole generally didn't like stout finishes, yeah. which I thought was really disappointing because it doesn't fit in with the the normal narrative. When I've had stout, stout finishes, I've really enjoyed them. So yeah, again, yeah. It could but just but be... is it because is it because Mike? Oh, is it because we tell ourselves we're going to like it because we love stout? Do you know oh, what I'm yeah. saying? And we're like, oh, you're convincing <clears throat> yourself that exactly. you sort of like things. What was it? I think Brian. Um, Volker commented in the week as well uh, on something he posted onto the Honest or Malt Twitter account saying, does the last dram of a bottle taste different? Because you know you can never replace it. So does mm. it taste better knowing that like this bottle you've loved, is it even better knowing you can't get it again? Is it like conscious bias? And I'd probably uh, say yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, perceptions affect everything, don't they? Yeah. Um, we we uh, was looking down at the list of sort of what branding's trying to achieve. And a lot of it, you can see um, how it would affect your your thoughts around what it is. So if you think about Macallan or any other really well-known whiskey brands, um, even like Japanese whiskey and what it costs now. I mean, really, if you're not trying it blind, is it really as good as you think it is? I mean, come on. I mean, is it is is, yeah. is a Yamazaki eighteen? Ben Nevis is perfectly good whiskey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but Mike's just saying that in case people know because a lot of Japanese whiskey, like um, Nika, is it in the barrel or from the barrel? Nika from the barrel is supposedly mostly Ben Nevis, or is known to be mostly Ben Nevis because Nika also own Ben Nevis. Distilled in Scotland, shipped yeah. Japan, bottled, yeah. shipped back. Then back. It's the for twice the, the price. The definition of an environmentally friendly, low. Urban, low, low carbon, low carbon footprint, low carbon footprint whiskey. We've, yeah, it's literally gone twenty four thousand miles. It's just going to back, get to your flogging glass. seagulls. You have to like yeah. kill seventeen seagulls with each yeah. bottle of Nika from the barrel. You the, you enjoy your you, you enjoy back. your glass of Nika and think about all those dead seagulls. It's the albatross brain. Yeah. <laughs> think, won't somebody think of the puffins? <laughs> uh, uh, I actually looked out the plane window this time when I was flying. Uh, I don't usually do that. I haven't done that in a long time. And um, are you a, uh, are you a comfortable flyer or are you a nervy flyer? Yeah, I, I one year I did one hundred twenty thousand air miles. I've just I got so bored of flying, but this mm. time I happened to find myself by the window, and um, I looked out and I was like, oh yeah, it's quite nice looking out the window, especially if you're going over the sea and you can mm. see all the ships and stuff. Anyway reinforcement so branding <laughs> I, were, I thought you were going on to a point there but you just sort of like no no i was just, I was a just beautiful moment i was expecting you just, to say like you saw like the recreation of the jurassic park scene where there was pelicans going over the water <laughs> no, flying away but no uh, no if i was going to say anything it would be i've pulled myself a different glengoyne oh this time it now. is the the master of malt 20 year old um single cask one so i'm having an entirely single cask glengoyne evening yeah uh which is a beautiful thing 
both are absolutely terrific. Um, just on branding and why branding distorts what we think, um, there's many things that people try to achieve through branding. You think mm. about some of your favorite whiskey brands, and there's nothing wrong with it because it, it 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 passes our messes with our brains, man. Yeah. But you know, and, and good on them. But branding creates desire. You know, for a start, you want that product. So then you yeah. want to tell yourself that you want to like that product. You know, branding. You think about Glen Scotia. Like Glen Scotia has great product, um, 100. Yeah. percent but we're all such fanboys of Glen Scotia now that we're all kind of like one of us, one of us. Yeah. So everyone's online doing that and you want to love it. So it would be really interesting to try some of the Glen Scotia's blind um, to, to see if we love them as much as we think we do. And I'm sure we will. I think we they do. are excellent. <laughs> but still, that's more generally what I'm saying. You know, nothing should be safe. No. Branding, that's one of those uh, brands. I think everyone knows I love it because I was banned from saying it for a while. But like, yeah, you can they, say it again. They are just consistently great whiskies and we i don't want it to take off i'm sorry glenn scotia i don't want you to be that successful <laughs> because i won't be able to get it it's already <laughs> hard enough getting another campbelltown distillery but it's also to do with, it's also to do with capacity you know like um so um searches for springbank have gone up um three to 3.5 times in the last 10 years i'm probably going to post an article about it mm. and you know their capacity is only seven hundred and fifty thousand liters a year or something it's not that much whereas you know, our big um, demand online, yeah, like Google search has only gone up slightly and something like Ben Romag stayed flat over the last 10 years. And so the point is, is that, you know, Lagavulin, our big, they all have more capacity than Springbank. So Springbank just doesn't have the capacity to service what yeah, it has. Yeah, yeah. And it has very established retail routes and clubs and all that kind of stuff. And so it just isn't the whiskey to go around for new entrants, new people that want to try it. So as new people come in, People who have been drinking it already can't get hold of it. Yeah. And so that's Springbank in a nutshell. What else on branding? So you've got here that bright, branding provides helpful and exciting solutions. I don't know if that really applies to whiskey. Maybe it does <laughs> to things like sending pouches through the post or whatever. It doesn't really apply to... Maybe it applies to... Sending wee whiskey. samples of wee through the post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but respect for people. Branding changes our spending way. And that's true. You know, like branding is literally there to convince you to spend more money on a bottle. Basically, and it works. The time. Yeah. Simplic simplicity works in branding, you know, like, and that's true too, you know, like um, the most successful whiskies are blends and they're sort of simply done um, and, and they're marketed in a sort of simpler way. Um, branding helps us to have desired social status. Also true because yep. you want something to taste good because you spend a lot of money on it or more money on it and because you, it makes you feel good because you're like, by drinking this particular bottle, I am achieving some kind of social status. Blind takes that all away, strips it all down. Branding makes you feel special. True, right? Branding affects our self-perception, how we feel about ourselves. And branding uh, satisfies, was it needs and current problems or something? I, well, if, I mate, know. it's, it's ev every facet. Most of it's to, to do with you, isn't it? Look most up and down at what you're wearing now. And you're, you're wearing, I guarantee Shorts, you, green shorts. Brand of something. Like there's something on you that's like brand. So Primarchy. Like Garmin watch. My, cr my Crocs, because I'm so cool. Yeah, like, yeah, for sure. Like, people spend loads of money on watches, and yeah, I've got, like, Nike sliders on. Why haven't I got unbranded sliders? Probably yeah. because it's hard to get them. I don't know. But I, I hope that from people listening to this, that if you haven't tried blind whiskeys with your friends, that you do that. Yeah. Get your friends to send you some whiskeys blind. Yeah. And try them and see what you think of them, and then find out what they've got. You can have guesses at what country it is, what distillery it is, what age it is. But more important than that, if you're worried about that side of things, is just do you like it and what do you get from it? Yeah. That's the most important thing. And then you will find out what you really like rather than what you think you like. Yeah. And if you're struggling to find people to share drams with and do blinds, then, you know, worst case, if you're desperate, come to me and Duncan. I'm sure we can drink whiskey with you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah yeah we'd happily do some more blind yeah. stuff I, I really really enjoy it and and you have to just be completely ready to make a bit of a numpty out of yourself 100 oh, um, I like that's why i like several times pinning my my reputation on stuff and it's so often incredibly wrong like i get the wrong country <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> i actually i have to say just in case bert smedley is listening to this i have to say that bert, bert did send me some some whiskeys once to try blind and i made a complete um tit of myself um, I convinced myself that he was going to send me Waterford and I guessed um, something which was 
like a 20 year old Glenn Grant as like Waterford and just because he got in my head man. yeah <laughs> he got he just he psyched me out and uh, and then and then afterwards but he's such a nice guy he, he goes flange why, why, just 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 try you know just go with just go with the whiskey why 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 are you allowing me to get in your head or something like that and just because he did because well, I was I believed it was I could convince myself yeah. he was going to send me Waterford so rather than just tasting the whiskey as it was I was I was trying to find the Waterford so even though it's blind you're still putting preconceived and products. I even remember oh, one no. of them going this is a really biscuity malty nose I was going it's got to be Irish it's got to be Irish no very I was going it feels like it's a sherry space side to me I was yeah. like, one of these has got to be Waterford which one is most likely <laughs> so yeah <laughs> I've got it in my own head, you know. Um, Funny. Yeah. Um, uh, we are going to, uh, so we should also just get on to a couple of um, uh, quick housekeeping topics. So I just want to say thank you very much for listening again to this pod. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are going to have guests on, I think, the next pod or the pod after, yep. which we'll announce very soon. We've also been in contact with people. So thank you to um, to anybody uh, who's, uh, who's agreed to come on. We won't reveal them now. We'll reveal them as we go. And if you would like to feature as a guest on the pod, feel free to reach out to uh, to Mike and I. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, just to reiterate what Duncan said, thank you again for listening. Um, we keep seeing those figures creeping up online and brilliant. Follow us, subscribe, do what you want. Remember, it's free. Do it's, us a biggie. <laughs> it is free. Like, it's subscribe, free. review, five stars. Yeah. All that definitely. jazz. Cheers, guys. Thank you. See you in the next one. Bye-bye-bye.